Welcome to Raven Talk, the official podcast of the Raven Tribe. The Raven Tribe is a home for warriors on the path and is dedicated to training warriors for the battlefield of life. Visit us on the web at theraventribe.com where you can learn more information on membership, warrior training, as well as links to our official YouTube channel, Facebook group, apparel store, and our official bookstore, Marshall Books. Welcome back, Tribe. We're here today with special guest Sean Kelly. Uh, I should say Professor Sean Kelly. Uh, very well-noted practitioner and instructor of American Kempo Karate, and also uh, very special to me because he's a fellow guardian angel, and uh, we've actually been able to share some training and uh, help our beloved guardian angels out there. So, Sean, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Great, great. Sean, so for the audience at home, I, I would ask if you could do me a favor and just briefly give us a little bit of your background in martial arts, and then we'll go ahead and get started on our questions for today. Uh, for the audience, we're going to be discussing Kempo Karate and specifically the technique sequences in Kempo Karate and the variation in curriculum as far as how many techniques are taught and get a little bit of insight as to why that is and how that may help the students out. So, Sean, uh, if you would, please uh, let the audience know a little bit about yourself as a martial arts instructor. Well, I started through a hobby of interest when it was popular back in the 70s. You know, I was at 12 years old. My first instructor was George Dillman out of Reading, Pennsylvania. I actually, my father had a uh, an insurance office just a few doors down from that area. So that's kind of like my first time of training was going into Mr. Dillman's school off of 5th Street of Reading, which lasted about a year. It was a, a very typical, traditional, Okinawan Kempo was what he taught then, uh, which to me, I, I wasn't really uh, um, excited by it. It wasn't really my thing, which meant that, you know, we all have a choice of interest. And, uh, and so because of that, you know, I pursued a different direction and I was um, then soon after that, I joined in with a gentleman by the name of Francisco Condi, who was uh, he had a school out of both Baltimore, Maryland area, and also out of Lancaster, which is really where I was at. And so I joined under Mr. Condi, and that's where I stayed, and that's where my my martial arts training started. And Mr. Condi was he, he was well known on the East Coast because of his background, as you know, his expertise, in, you know, bringing and breaking the uh, era of the East Coast in the 60s, probably when the racial tension was quite known back in the day when there was all that back in the day where uh, African-American and other ethnic background people couldn't go to tournaments. Mr. Condi was known because he was a POW. He was born in Manila in the Philippines, and he uh, had an organization called the Oriental Defensive Arts Association, and what made him kind of popular to that time and era was he broke down the wall of of the tension and said, "Hey, we're all we're all one, and as martial artists, we should all be invited together." And back in those days, you know, the tournament circuit was becoming more and more well known, and that was what he was known for on that side is uh, his promotional tournaments uh, in in putting on. And he was actually one of the first people to put on a a PKA fight as well. But it was Mr. Condi who actually uh, gave me the opportunity to train not only in Muda Kwan, but because of the Filipino background arts. But he was also a, a, a member of Ed Parker's IKK. He had an eighth degree in Matsumura Shonru, and through the military judo federation, he was a black belt is there too. So then I was on the kickboxing league, and so uh, as my training pursued forward, it later on became a career. And then, as I speak today as an international instructor, I really wanted to pursue this as a long time career. But I was really interested in the the fighting science, not only because of my background in point karate or the kickboxing, trained with people like Joe Lewis and my good friend Bill Wallace, but uh, as an expert more toward the street side of things, I was intrigued with Ed Parker, and my first time meeting him was in 1978 at a Baltimore tournament that Mr. Condi was putting uh, on, and Mr. Parker came as a guest. And what kind of like brought my attention more Obviously, it was when Mr. Uh, Condi used to have a photo in his office signed by Elvis, and it was the picture of uh, Mr. Parker and Elvis Presley together in that posing position, and I was a big Elvis fan. And he would walk in, and he uh, had this jacket that said, you know, uh, Ed Parker's uh, Karate Studios. So and Ed Parker was a known name. I mean, everybody knew Ed Parker in, in the martial arts community, and then he was always on the East Coast coming in as a guest. But when I met him... 
and saw what he he was doing. I mean, he was the fastest individual I ever seen uh, in front of my very eyes. But as I became older and I knew things were going to change in my career, uh, I did the point stuff. I did the sport, but I found myself more interested toward the self defense aspect, the realism, if you will. And pretty much that's where I uh, consider myself now as more of a Kempo guy. So as far as what do I do or what is what is my proficiency, I would say more toward that direction now. Now, Sean, we're we're talking specifically about Kempo, and the question that I wanted to pose to you is about the amount of techniques taught in Kempo. And before we get into that, I was hoping you might be able to share with me a little bit about how Mr. Parker learned Kempo, because he is very well known for revolutionizing Kempo, making it uh, something very accessible to the American audiences. And it's my understanding that the way he learned Kempo was different than what he then created in his teaching of Kempo. So before we look at what he did, can you tell us a little bit about how he got there? Well, his teacher was Professor William Chow in Hawaii. So the version he got would be what would be more toward what was being taught for the Hawaiian culture of things, which is through Professor Chow. But he gave a lot of credit to Professor Chow because of the uh, way he taught. And Professor Chow was known to um, explore out of the out of the box of things. In other words, very open-minded. He was known for his, his strength and his speed. And, you know, then they bring in the topic about Matosi and how Chow worked with Matosi, which would be more toward the Japanese influence. But the fact remains that it is technically irrelevant to what – somebody like my generation would say uh, would be involved with. And the reason I say it in that content is if Ed Parker came to the to United States and opened up his schools in 54 or 1956, what we have to understand is Ed Parker evolved himself. And so did his Kempo, which meant Ed Parker's system of Kempo. And Ed Parker uh, had other people other than himself create this art. I mean, he... He surrounded himself with some very particular individuals. He's got some of the best of who he felt was his signature, like an artist. Think of it like a you know a garden with all the seeds in the dirt, and each one of them would you know grow into their own little uh, capabilities of what they're known for. And that was what he was very good at. And versus my way, or you you can't do it any different. It has to be one way. And you know his books titled themselves Infinite Insights. It wasn't definite insights. It was called Infinite. And he wanted people to get to the point of being able to problem solve and, and, and seek solutions if there was an existing issue when it comes to their personal safety and be logical in the content of their thinking. He, he gave a lot of respect to tradition. He understood formalities and customs. But he said, you know, when it comes down to being a street fighter, and the violence that you may be faced with. And this is where the advantage of his background with psychology or sociology is that he understood cultural differences. Now, what happened in the 50s became far different than it did in the 60s. Then here we go in the 70s and then in the 80s. And then he passed away in 1990. So there's generations for every every era. And if you look at some of the original uh, flyers or advertising – that was put out with Ed Parker. You can see it was like most schools, very traditional. They were all fighting schools uh, back then. You know, you you trained hard. You did a lot of calisthenics, and you know, and sparring or, or freestyle fighting was where you put it on and say, okay, you against me and me against you. Let's see who the winner is. But if you did it in a sport arena, with typically to be rules, you'd never be able to tell what style uh, is what, other than the very fact each person has two hands and two feet. But what made Ed Parker different was when they had, for example, let's say the internationals, and you had those different classes of weapon division or sparring divisions, forms or kata divisions, he pretty much exposed what was called the self-defense division, which is what Ed Parker was best known for, and that was teaching people how to uh, defend themselves and then also to defend yourself against someone who was a practitioner. Because even in the martial arts, you got people who, case in point, like the, you know, the Karate Kid movie, you know, with the Cobra Kai, 
here you got a karate instructor, the sensei, and now he's the, he's the bad guy. So there are bad guy karate people who taught almost like they're thugs. And you know, the martial arts can land in the hands of anyone. Just like the word martial, meaning war, you never know who your enemies are. So when you study a particular art, whatever your choices are, just realize that you never know who may learn the martial arts. So never underestimate anyone whatsoever. Be a little more humble about, you know, and appreciate, by the way, each art system, wherever they're from, have strong values. You may not agree with all of them. You don't have to. But look at what they do offer and look at it in that content because you can learn from everybody. And so Ed Park developed a system. And what I mean by a system that he brought in, you know, physics. He brought in mathematical geometry, everything he could to teach his students, both young and old, that there's a logical way to move from A to B using what he called the economy of motion. And if you wanted to capitalize on that, he'd fill your brain, okay, with this barrage of, of, of arsenal because you never know if you're going to miss. You never know if the guy's going to be able to take what you throw at him. And more than importantly, you don't know if that situation may land you one against two of them. Mass attack. So that would be a good way to look at this um, and, and look at it deeply. Too. You can see you can see the boxing content. You can also see it or review the fact that in Hawaii it was known as Kempo Jiu Jitsu. You know the original Jiu Jitsu, not, not the sport so much that we see maybe today, but the locks, the throws, you know, the manipulation, those kind of things. It was all added into it, and and also the the kicking was. Uh, a precursor. In other words, it was an addition to someone who was defending themselves because anything you could use as a, as a weapon, a natural weapon, he wanted to bring that to the table. And so he would study and he would work with, I mean, people like Bruce Lee back in the day, Wally J. All these people were his friends, Tadashi Yamashita. And he had a strong, strong relationship with the Chinese uh, group especially in California. And if people really want to look back into the in-depthness of his background, you'll be surprised, for example, when I bring up the topic about Mr. Condi, Francisco Condi, you don't see that he was listed on his IKK Kempo tree chart, which was an argument. You know, who was Ed Parker's highest ranked people? Or you know, here we go with the rank game thing. But it's funny, in 1975, when his Nunchuck book comes out, he does mention that one of his students at that time, being a seventh degree black belt, had created and was the patent of a specific custom made nunchuck called the Panchaka. And his name was Francisco Condi. So Ed Parker surrounded himself with a lot of people, a lot of people, and some had more exposure than others. So that means simply that, you know, he had so much of a network out there, nobody would know all the people. Now, with that also being said, he also had his company quite often in Chinatown. And there's some Chinese people that go way back, and Laboon would be one of them to look into his history and, and what relationship he had with Ed Parker or Jimmy Wu. You know, even with the, the Tracy brothers who, you know, kind of branched off um, from Parker in the 60s and, you know, what they brought to the table, regardless of animosity. You know, it's it's the the value of the martial arts is 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 a strong strong uh, situation in in throughout the United States and the world. But it's a benefit that a lot of people, more so now than ever, it's not just a club anymore. It's actually a, a professional place you can go as a business, as a commercial outlet for both men, women, and children. So there, there's a lot of qualities that if you invest in the martial arts training, no matter what discipline you uh, go into, typically it's the relationship you find with the instructor, not so much what he's teaching because most people don't have maybe the skill of knowing the differences, but judge that a, a, as your plate to say, I want to build this relationship and I, the school I happen to go into teaches this discipline and stay committed to it. So that's the, I mean, that's the best introduction I can say as far as the martial arts in, in general. No, Sean, the the system that Parker created, when he began to teach the system, and as you said, there are many eras to to his teaching career. Yep. 
there have been different versions of the required techniques, how many techniques you learn at each belt level. I've seen schools that teach, you know, upward of 100 techniques. I've seen some schools that teach, you know, uh, a total of like 40 techniques. Right. What is the, you know, where did this start? Um, you know, what would, what did it look like in the first era when he is starting to formulate his American Kempo? How many techniques were you learning up to your first degree black belt when you first? Well, you got the average person was learning either. I'm going to go back to the let's say the version in the, maybe the 70s or 80s, and that would be the 24 version. So that meant 10 belt uh, techniques for for uh, the yellow belt, in other words, for white belt to yellow, and then 24 all the way up and through black, and then you had what's called extensions. And the extensions were additional movements added on to the base techniques. So unless you understood the Kempo system as a system other than a punch, kick, and block art and everything else that kind of stood out, you got to understand that, you know, once you got past first degree level, you know, some people have this idea that, you know, once I'm a black belt, I guess I, I know it all. I'm done. Whereas even a, a traditionalist, let's say in, in the Japanese art, First degree means shodan. Shodan is a translation meaning firstborn. Technically meaning you're like you're really new at the art. And a black belt really is someone who is a uh, expert in their basics. So this is for, not everybody is meant to even get a black belt. I mean I, I just don't believe that. I mean you don't go around handing. What's funny we have ten and twelve year old first degree black belts. But how funny it is, you've got to be 16 even to try to attempt to get a driver's license. And you've got to be 21 to, to vote or whatever the age may be. So the restrictions on, on the martial arts, is it's, they forget that there is a sense of maturity and responsibility and that the body and mind, just like going to school, you know, what you learn in fourth grade isn't the same as ninth grade. So there should be a point of understanding that this is something that becomes a lifestyle versus a fast fix. Now, as far as the technique order, and, and that time and era, let's say this go into maybe the 60s and even the 70s, most of the clientele base were men. And then the women came in. Now, more so than ever, the, the, the population is mostly geared now for children. And so because of that, of course, they had to cut down the responsibility of how many, because they can't learn that much. So it's too much for, it's an overload for young people based on just the education in itself, especially the terminology. You know, some of the words we use are based on people that have a, a sense of intelligence or can understand that there, there's a lot of hidden codes, if you will. In other words, there's there's uh, names that are not really uh, used unless you understand the terminology and how it's laid out. So it was quite clever in how and why he did. It's like watching baseball, and you look over to the corner of the field, and you see this sideline coach doing hand signals. Well, the martial arts really is, is, is supposed to have a sense of being a secret. Don't go around showing your secrets. That's what gives you a somewhat, a, hopefully, an upper hand. It's something you you learn extra in case of a situation that uh, you don't typically have the normal upper hand of, of the abilities of getting out of problems called escape. But these extra skills were just quite unique besides the, the element of uh, exercising and building the body and strengthening the you know the immunities and everything else that comes out of it. You know, the the investment of going, wow, look what it's done for me. So we could trace the uh the history of martial arts in itself and say, you know, really what's gonna benefit? Our, our culture in itself needs to be taught about the philosophy, the investment of the return, and what it does as, as a human being. Uh, and the biggest issue we have now is the lack of respect and discipline, which is lacking all throughout the world. I mean, we have more violence now than ever. And I don't know what the statistics are, but I can guarantee you people are more and more now learning martial arts just for their own personal safety because of the violence. So... It's definitely a, a continued education. It is a, a different language to learn, but most people who are really in, involved with it, they seek it in such a way it just becomes part of who they are up until the rest of their entire life. Now, Sean, 
it's a great insight, and, and I think you're correct. I mean, people are going to learn and, and pick this material up. It, it's going to be a lifelong endeavor for them. With the change in the amount of techniques that were taught, did you ever – because you've been training Kempo for a very long time, and I'm sure you've seen some of these changes. Did this ever cause any kind of concern that, you know, maybe they were producing – students that knew less, you know, that things were getting watered down, or was there even maybe animosity between people from a different era that said, hey, I had to learn twice as much as you did for that the was, same rank? I mean, how did, how did the yeah. Temple community handle that? How was that navigated? It, it, was, it was just like you said. It was, you know, you, you got people who felt uh, their time and error was stronger and, and harder than were they. But that's quite, that's what happens with the generation differences. Uh, and that's across the board. That's not even just in, in the Kempo community. But then you also have, the, and we have to understand this, the generations today across the board feel a sense of entitlement of, I need it now, how much is it, I'm going to, and then people give it away. And there are some people who are in the driver's seat of so-called position of being master instructors, and quite honestly, they're there by default which means maybe it's somebody ahead of them or older than them passed away just because they it was their time. And they felt it was my time now to take on uh, the new role of being the position that I'm in and I'm going to change things around and this is how it's done. And, and they're geared more toward, you know, how should I say it, selling the product and giving it away at a, at a less qualified rate. So – it could be argumentative from one person to the next person, and they're probably both right in, in their thought process. I think it's a personal choice. But the individual deciding if that's the direction they want to take, if you get it cheap, it's because you wanted it that way. It's the old expression by going to the store and going, oh, man, I'm not going to pay that much for this at this place. Let me go somewhere else. They'll go somewhere else, and they know they're going to find it. But that's up to them. You know, and, and I mean, I I don't do that, and maybe you wouldn't do that. So there's there's those select few that want to learn more about a particular uh, uh, art, or its origins, or its customs, or some of the ways things were taught. Even like movement, like if you learn a new form or a technique or whatever you want to call that, you know, you can mimic any any kind of motion and movement, but if you understand it it's meaningless and even ed parker put in his books you know what's what's a form that's taught to a student if you don't understand its true identity other than meaningless motion you just copycatted it and what happens in the kempo community because people are fascinated by speed the faster i go i must look cool and i'm devastating well a lot of times they're going fast because they just want to hide their mistakes and they don't think the real people who understand the art well enough have the eye to de pay attention to the detail of their mistakes, which is fine. But is having uh, too many moves uh, not benefiting something? Well, I have to agree that if you're in a real situation and if you're accurate with your movements, it only should take a few moves to put anybody down on the ground. But what happens if you didn't have a follow-up plan? <laughs> And there's that psychological part that happens in a real altercation called techie psyche effect, whereas you get into what's called shock. You shut down, you can't move. You get tunnel vision, audio disturbance. Okay, things seem to go in slow motion. You can't get your body to operate. You got a little bit of tunnel vision going on. So what happened is there, there's more to it than the, the obvious uh, side of it, but there's an internal training side that goes with it too, and, and that is you train to be better and more accurate that hopefully down the road you'll never have to use any of this because you could see the telltale signs way ahead, and the best thing for you to do is exit and get out of there. Or like playing pool, you could do one of, of a few things. Sink the ball. Or put that ball when it's your turn in such a way it cancels out his next move. And Ed Parker did it strategic, you know, strategically in that content. So it's it's really broken down from nose to toes. It does have the linear moves, just like the Okinawan Japanese hard styles. It has the circular movements, 
just like the Chinese systems. It has the, the manipulation and grappling parts that the uh, jiu-jitsu would have. But Ed Parker, when I had conversations with him, he was adamant, adamant about be aware of multiple attackers. And we have that more now than ever. And you know that firsthand in, in the area of Chicago where you're having those mob issues going on where people are just walking down the street and about 15 to 20 came out of nowhere. And so being with the guardian angels, you know, and work in particular areas, you know, we learn a few things. Our awareness level becomes much more sharp. So when I introduced Ed Parker to Curtis Sliwa in 1988 at one of my seminars, Curtis uh, had asked Ed Parker, he goes, I'm having an issue, Mr. Parker, circumstantially in, in England. And they were having some problems with this underground situation where these particular uh, – gang members were using uh, finger-edged razor blades and just cutting people. And Ed Parker told him, he says, you know, I'd have to look deeper into the problem to give you a, before I can give you, you know, a solution right now. Let's set up a further meeting and let's discuss, you know, what's really going on and how we can help your members. Because he knew that guardian angel members, when they patrolled, you know, you went without weapons and we were searched. So the only weapon you had was not only your level of awareness and your physical capabilities, but hopefully you had the knowledge, which was at that time, you know, you trained in the martial arts, a some style and or system so that you had some sense of an upper hand. And the fact was, is that we had by the numbers, you know, we had members that were on street patrols that you were there more than just maybe two or three people. I mean, there was back in the day, you know, you'd have 15, almost 30, depending on the size of the patrol. So you had your numbers to your advantage, which was always something we trained with the organization, and that is team tactics. So as far as to answer your question in regards to how much is too much, you know, if you learn how to deal with a right-hand attack, a left-hand attack, and anything you find to be in the content of your arsenal of threat, you're good. You can pick and choose. As a matter of fact, Ed Parker, when he did his seminars in my company, he would tell the audience, which was what he was really good at, and it was an open audience, not just Kempo schools. We had Taekwondo, Ch uh, Shotokan. We had all kinds of – it was open clinics when we were doing things on the East Coast with Mr. Condi and Mr. Parker. And he would say, I'm going to share with you too, because I'm not going to teach you nothing. But what I am going to do is share with you. And he, made it, he said it in that content because he didn't want anyone to take it that he was demanding anything. Take what you like. Discard what you find is useless. But never throw it away out of your reservoir of knowledge. It's like a toolbox. We all know on the bottom shelf there's that tool that's in there, probably still with the price tag on it. But there may be that one time you may need to new use it. So what works here in Florida or the Chicago area, and that's even pulled that out about, you know, the environment is also a predict uh, a predicament of of a measure of your defense. And he would tell people, hey, what works here doesn't work overseas. You know, environment, the temperature, your clothes, the terrain, the position of your body, the position of their body. All these factors come into play when it comes to survival and strategy toward the combative side of things. And he made it – he had a blueprint, and he would pretty much try to give everybody a little recipe of knowledge – but he wanted everyone to use these uh, these samples because technically the techniques were just case uh, circumstances. They were just examples of, of things that he wanted them to deal with. Once they became more familiar, it's no longer foreign. So the more you're familiar about how to deal with a right punch, a left punch, this kick, that kick, a front attack, a back attack, this hold on your head, a front choke, a rear choke, a back choke, knife attack, club attack, then the firearms came in. He knew that after so many years of training that on the mat, it wasn't for, it wasn't brand new to you. You didn't get caught by surprise because you trained it. Versus the person who goes, man, I've never put in a full Nelson before, or I've never had someone come at me with a combination, a jab and a right cross, and then the guy who came at me with a kick soon after I blocked it, like a retaliation move. Well, that's how he laid out the system, so that when you were like an orange belt and someone grabs you with their left hand on your hair, he'd later on say, okay, now let's do it with the right hand. Or let me take it and put the person that's going to grab you maybe from the back. So he changed the position 
that you got so fixed into and just made you think for a moment, and you call that variable expansion, where you take one or two moves and change them up a little bit and say, these are the same moves, but look at them here now differently. So he wanted to overwhelm uh, you with always be open-minded to circumstances, even the situations where you thought may not happen could happen as a possibility. He called that what if, or what if, and then say, okay, well, now we have a what if, what would you do about it? How would you deal with it? And then go into the spontaneous state where you just kind of like, you know, build your defense and have your arsenal on the offense and just retaliate. So that takes time, and that's why it's called training, and it's continuous training. Some people are very content with, you know, I got my orange belt the other day or my purple belt, and I feel that I can now stop, you know, block somebody if they throw something at me. Good. You know, nobody forces anybody to, you know, proceed forward all the way through the level of black belt. I know what it's like when I got my black belt. I'm like, oh, my gosh. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a wake-up call. And the wake-up call is, well, I got, my, I got the, the cloth. Now I got to represent, which meant there was people looking at me differently as well. And there is a maturity with everything in life. And this is, I think, what's quite unique about uh, it becoming a lifestyle is that you do learn later on to economize things. And you realize that, you know, what you did in your 20s, you couldn't do today if you wanted to if you were in your 40s or 50s. So you've got to adjust all that. And it does get you through through times of struggle. And the camaraderie, mind you, is, is it's phenomenal. i got to say that's probably one of the greatest things I ever saw and, and can say. And I just had this interview with somebody else the other day. And I said, you know, I involved myself personally in two, I think, organizations or two things that I involved myself with. And in both of these circumstances, none of them, none of them whatsoever did it come to – a conversation of concern, and that is the color of their skin, their background and where they had come from, if they were white, African-American, Japanese, Hawaiian, who cared? I, I never got that. And just like when you earn a belt, you earn different colors of a belt. But boy, we got more hate and pointing fingers and black lives matter and this matters and that don't matter than ever and you have to sometimes look at this and go, you guys obviously need a little sense of self-respect versus all this media uh, contamination and toxic ways of looking at stuff and not realizing that the martial arts are beyond the point of punch, kick, and block. You know, to buy a AAA in case their car breaks down and only hope that if they needed a jump that someone show up. Whereas us in the martial arts, for example, I have a Kempo card which means I could be anywhere in the world, and I grant you this. If I had needed something, I could pick up that card, make a phone call. If I'm in South America or Germany or Ireland, and I, it could be a complete stranger. With technology today, all i got to do is, hey, is there any Kemple brothers out there in uh, in Dublin or in San Diego, Chile, or, you know, or this place in you know, Germany or this place in the United States, and I bet you I can get someone coming to help me. It's like an automatic brotherhood. Same thing as you know, as you and I are having a conversation now. Once a guardian angel family member, it's for life. And we family can have their indifferences. You know, they fight all the time. But when it comes at the end of the day, we should, we definitely can count on each other. And being the fact that I've dealt with crisis down here in Florida, you know, during the hurricanes that I've dealt with, they're the first that came to my aid. Not only the guardian angel friends and family, but my martial arts. Uh, uh, extended family. We, we help each other at all times. So I have a different opinion and philosophy when it comes to being a martial human. No, excellent insight, Sean, and that's definitely true. Now, Sean, let me ask you this. As an instructor, I know that you pride yourself on your work. You're a, a real professional. You invest in your students. You worry about you know their well-being and their safety. When you're preparing a black belt, you give your students a certain amount of the syllabus, you expect yep. them to understand it and to know it. How do you feel about the schools that may have stuck with that smaller curriculum where people are learning, you know, 10 techniques per level and then they get to their black belt? Do you think that, and I've heard arguments, you know, going both ways. I've heard some people say, well, 
you know, less techniques doesn't mean it's watered down. It means it's actually concentrated. You know, you're, you're getting all the essentials, but none of the fluff. And other people say, no, you know what? You're just not getting enough to really get a real understanding of what's going on. From your point of view as an instructor, you know, would you trust your black belts if they had done 10 techniques per level? Or do you want them to have more saturation and more information to work with when they get to that level? As far as from a, a personal safety point of view is, you know, like I'm going to prepare this person to be a black belt and they're going to walk out on the street. And if God forbid they have to protect themselves, I want to make sure they can do it right. How do you feel about that? It's, it's almost like that's a multiple question. And I'll say it in this content. We, you mentioned in, in the dialogue about safety. I heard you say that, correct? And then I heard the word black belt to prepare them for black belt. Well, am I preparing them for a belt or am I preparing them for their true uh, true need of safety? Because everyone's case by case differently, mentally, physically, psychologically, emotionally, all these factors come into play. They really do. A good coach will profile the student. Now, it is not my place and I've learned this to have an opinion toward any other instructor as to what they require their student to be a black belt. It's not my spot because that student may not be in the same mindset of what a black belt means to them versus what it means to maybe you or I. So that's really an unfair, I think, question. And and as far as the answer is concerned, it's really not even our place to answer because we don't even know the individual's history. So it's really easy to have an image of what we think a black belt is but then again, it's just an image because a lot of them, uh, you almost have to say, well, have you ever been around a good black belt before? I don't think in today's society, some of them don't even know know that for themselves anyways. Where, I mean, where are they going to see that? If they're looking on TV and they're using the UFC as their as their definition of an image of a black belt, they're not even wearing belts. So we almost have to separate overall this question and say watered down or what if the instructor himself didn't learn from a second or first generation or, or any of the generations that worked with Ed Parker because let's understand something right now. He died in 1990. It's 2016. So how many real generations uh, of first, second, third are even around anymore that some of them have never even really met probably only heard of them, but never had the chance to be in their company to go, oh my gosh, that's a big difference to in, in what I was taught just by the principles and concepts of what's being taught and spoken about or highlighted. So what I'm getting at is it's unfair for anyone to have an opinion on someone else's student if that instructor says, well, that's the best they can do. And since I'm that instructor, and the relationship is an A-B conversation, you know, you can almost see your backside out of this because it's not really your place, and we have to respect that. And that would apply to you, that would apply to me, that would apply to anyone because we are the ones who had that first introduction and encounter, and if they're better than when they first came and, and under their eyes they've improved, and if that instructor his criteria was to be met by that student, whatever that criteria might have been, then I guess that's okay because guess what? They both agreed on that. That's their contract between two individuals, not from my place. Now, it's like you wouldn't be an instructor if you didn't have a student. So we have to be very thankful that someone admires our teaching skills because without the students, there is no instructors. And to instruct, that means you have to have the ability to communicate, not only on the physical level, okay, but the verbal communication skills. Ed Parker used to tell people, a good instructor is when I pick up the phone, I'm calling you from California, and at the end of this telephone, since I can't see you, you need to describe to me in detail principles and concepts if I ask you about a particular technique and or situation, and I clearly can tell what you mean because you give it back to me descriptively and with clarity. 
And see, that's what set us a little bit different than many arts is that we definitely had a vocabulary of motion and definitions that we could utilize like a professor going to college. And that's what really stood out differently in the advanced portions of the Kempo system. And so some don't have that knowledge. It's just it, maybe they just didn't find an interest in going there. Maybe it was too deep for them. Who knows? Okay, because, you know, it, it is what it is. I mean, there's a lot of people who have never graduated high school and, and, and so forth and so on. But in the martial arts, it's, it's not anyone's opinion, and we have a lot of opinions. We have a lot of anger of people being judgmental over another person. And the challenges that we have, though, at that is there's there's a lot of fraud. You know, there's a lot of, you know, people out there doing the martial arts just for their hidden agendas, and it, it's money in their pocket. And the word integrity and honesty and all these factors that should be a part of the byproducts of the art are not being taught. And as far as I'm concerned, those people will be short term. And we know who they are. You know who they are. And they're not that just but those are in the martial arts community, not under any particular system or style only. They're out there by the abundance. You know, but again, it's it's not governed. You gotta understand, man invented it. Man can change it, and that's why. And Sean, that's a, a very fair, you know, answer t- to my question. And I, I don't want you to think that uh, <clears throat> I'm in any way trying to, you know, make judgments on other instructors. It, let me kind of rephrase this a little bit and maybe get my point across a little bit better. American Kempo has a. a very well defined curriculum, probably more than any other martial art I've seen, you know, of, of, of the modern martial arts out here. And my question is, with more limited and more streamlined curriculum that's being used, can the student acquire what they need to really understand the system? Are yes. They they, yeah. they can. Okay. Yes, they can. And here's why this is important. Ed Parker was one man. So. One of the seniors once said, and, and, and you almost have to listen to what he had said, and I understand what he said. And he says, you know, nobody, nobody's doing Ed Parker's Kempo. He died. Like nobody's doing Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. He died too. So under the content of what those two people who passed, what it is is really their, their, their labeled art. Each one of them, even though they're no longer with us, there's probably more people studying each one of those arts now more than ever since their passing, which meant they left a hell of an imprint and they left a hell of a uh, interest in the population, which is quite interesting because Ed Parker and Bruce Lee had a lot of parallels. Now, this is a fact. If Ed Parker's system broke down to the law of the fist and JKD was broken down as the intercepting fist, if we really look deep in between the relationship between the two of them and the people they surrounded themselves with, there's a lot of great, unique circumstances that run very, very parallel in regards to closeness, which is unique. Unique because they got along with others, okay? And Bruce Lee will always be known for what he was best at. Now, the only thing I had an issue with and still will for just my opinion is people would say that, you know, Master Bruce Lee or whatever they titled him at. Well, nobody, I think, at 23 or 24 years old is going to be a master of anything. Okay, he's too young. He died at 32. So was he at, in the top of his era and in, in, in where he became and where he went? Most definitely. But one thing about Bruce Lee was he had a great sense of arrogance. But because he could back it up is where he'd have good days and bad days depending on his audience. You know, and everybody talked about the 1964 internationals where he kind of like was showing his 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 art to the to the you know to the audience, and he kind of like you know grabbed a lot of the attention of of the media and everything else because Ed Parker said I want you to do this and he did that and he became popular. Well, there's some uncovered print in the back. Because of the people who would come to the internationals, and a lot of them were very – they were traditionalists. They could be Korean traditionalists or Japanese traditionalists. You know how that used to go. It's my way or the highway, and there's a lot of prejudice 
uh, thought processes back and still are today in culture to culture. Well, Bruce Lee pissed off a whole lot of people because of what he said. You know, he wasn't believing in, in, in tradition. He believed that things need to be changed and people have the right to be more free. And, you know, there's no – and him and Ned Parker would have their arguments about, you know, because he didn't believe in set patterns. And Ed Parker would say, no, as a beginner, I think set patterns allows a beginner to have a, a foundation to start with. Just like you, Bruce, you started with Wing Chun and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we can argue things day and night. It, it doesn't really matter. You can, you know, it's good to have friendly debate. But in regards to Ed Parker's art, you know, it depends. It was so available in regards to now becoming such an international system organized at that and he kept at it i mean he made it and he authored books he put it out because of his relationship with with the entertainers you know elvis being his most famous student and all the people out of hollywood you know he, he opened up a lot of doors and then of course 90 1991 speaks brought out the perfect club and it was another big bang and exposing you know exposing the audience There's another side of that partner like there are with the masters. The philosophical point. You know, life lessons, you know. Learn how to be humble and teach humility and, and think of this sort. And if you find yourself needing to protect somebody who can't, we owe it, there's almost a code of conduct as a, as a black belt, and that is responsibility to protect the weak, which – one of the very reasons why I got involved with the Guardian Angels is because of, of a situation, and that is a lot of the Guardian Angels, well, they're more braver than people that I've seen that are supposed to be the champions of the karate schools, you know, and I, I witnessed it firsthand. I'm like, damn, here we got Guardian Angels. Many of them, they, they train a little bit, not a lot, for those who did. And for the ones who did just a little bit, because they got more heart and more guts than than many well-known martial arts people that are out there in this world claiming all their world championship belts and bragging about their trophies. And you don't see them in the city. You don't see them in the routine trying to be more prime preventative or doing service to the community. That, that, that's, I find that kind of odd, but that's just my opinion. But back to in regards to curriculum, it's, it's going to vary. And I had a conversation with one of Mr. Parker's original guys, Tom Bleeker, and he made a profound statement because, you know, he knew Bruce Lee. Matter of fact, Tom Bleeker was married to Linda Lee after Bruce had passed. Him and uh, Linda Lee were married as, as a couple, and he went and he wrote some books about Bruce Lee. And matter of fact, one most interesting book was Unsettled Matters in regards to what really happened to Bruce. Did he die of natural causes, or was he killed by the syndicate, the Chinese syndicate. Who knows? But it's an interesting book. And that's another part that doesn't get talked about, and that is you know, the martial climate of things. And Ed Parker developed an Americanized system based on his Hawaiian heritage, the Chinese-Japanese culture of mix, where all the martial arts kind of come together, which is very typical American. We'll use anything and everything as long as it works. And Chuck Sullivan, when he was here with us one time, he even said, hey, I remember Ed Parker telling us, hey, if that works, we're going to take it. <laughs> we're going to steal it. We're going to make it work. So it's opinionated as to too much stuff, not enough stuff. Um, we only need this much stuff to make it work or – Students don't want to stay that long, so we have to shorten the, the criteria. I think it's the personality of the instructor from the day the, inst the student walks in is to teach them expectations. And part of our society is fixed on fast and fix things just within moments. And that, to me, is a problem. We can't even get kids off the couch because all they got to do is uh, play with their games. So some of the nature that allows us good health and wellness and mental state. You know, they discuss now and telling the students, uh, you know, in the school system, we're going to take away cursive writing and stuff of this sort. And the reason why is because it's not on your cellular device or your laptop. So we're going to just push buttons. Matter of fact, you don't even have to think anymore. Just Google the answer. So there's no solution finding. 
And one thing about Ed Parker was he said, we're going to give you a problem, but we would like you to find a solution for it instead of us having a thing for you. And I kind of like that because it made you become creative and problem solving because not everybody's going to be able to defend situations for you. You're going to have to come up with your own answers. So he allowed you to grow. And that's why the system may have been stretched out. And in some cases, he gave more information because what he did find, and this is a good uh, thing to understand, is some of the shorter arts that are out there, let's take Taekwondo or some of the other uh, arts that are out there today, it's a, and the qualification to be a black belt could be hell. Two years. Think about that. Two years. And that means you qualified in two years' time. And how much real time is two years? Three three days a week? Two days a week? Four hours out of the given week? It's 12 hours in a month. Multiply that by the 12 months. And we're going to tell someone that they physically, emotionally, okay, and mentally, they're a black belt now. So that, that, that's something to digest. So why don't they just take the term of I don't want to go that long, which they don't have to sign up for. And as we tell some of the students that we deal with in our organization is when they ask this, well, how long does it take the average person to get a black belt? And the answer should be a simple one. Average people don't get black belts. It's the other people who do. Nice. I definitely like that one, Sean. Well, Sean, I want to thank you for taking time out to be with us today, and I hope to get you back on. I would really love to get you back on soon to talk about your anti-bullying program. You've been doing some wonderful work with that, and I think it's time we visit that on the program for sure. Well, I want to thank you always for the honor. Continue doing what you do and enjoy the differences of all the people you have to interview. I mean, there's a lot of great talent. There's really a lot of great arts and systems. I just like the the opportunity anytime to just share. If we can share, it makes it even more where I can keep myself stimulated. You know, at 54 years old, I love learning. It's just excellent. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Sean. And before we go, if people want to reach out to you, um, you teach all around the world. You do seminars. You have camps. If they're locally in Florida and want to come out and get some training with you on American Kempo, where can people reach out to you? Well, you know, we're on Facebook, so they can, you know, hunt down my name, Sean Kelly, or they can go to the, one of our websites, and you know, they can go to the www.stomp, S-T-O-M-P, thebullying.net, which kind of tells you what we've been trying to do is create these martial arts safe place with, you know, certified facilitators to take the martial arts community uh, of interest and serve the areas where we can help these people that are dealing with the bullying crisis, which is quite dangerous more now than ever where we're having uh, children commit suicide. And I think it's our responsibility as martial humans to give a tangible resource to mentor them before it gets to that extent. So I'm easy to find. They can find me. They can call you. They can call anybody within the martial arts because the ones who have been around, we all know each other. So we're more than happy. Like I had a call today from someone on the East Coast, and I just said, hey, you're in this area, contact this person. They're not too far from you. So we all know each other well enough and where we're at in this world. Uh, we can connect the dots. Excellent. Well, again, Sean, thank you for being with us. Thank you for giving us some of your insight into American Kempo Karate, and it's been wonderful speaking to you. Thank you very much. Always, always, and you take care. Be safe.